Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, folks. Welcome. I'm just going to wait a, a minute or so for folks to trickle in. How's everyone doing? Everyone's doing well. Awesome. Feel free. I mean, until people, you know, trickle in, feel free to say hi on the chat. If you want to say where you're from, you know, what was the last CS assignment you were working on? Um, feel free to do so. Or last midterm you had, maybe? <laughs> everyone. Yeah, I guess how many folks are, so I, I see a few names I recognize. So I think there's some UCSD folks. So I know some people are on quarter system. Uh, so I'm assuming y'all are studying for finals. Oh, Sebastian said his last midterm was stochastic processes. Pretty fun stuff. Oh, nice. That's a Sounds interesting. Nice, nice. Hopefully it went well. So we're starting a, you know, a quick poll with a couple of questions. You guys don't mind answering. Yeah, and, and basically, so for this poll that we opened, we just want to get your general, just some like general knowledge about everyone so that we can better tailor our future events to, to folks. This is super helpful for us. Uh, let's see, Ignatius working on a second project. Ooh, nice, nice. Good luck. Uh, last mention was CSE 160, parallel computing. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. And Albert is a senior, graduate from Portland State, uh, now taking computer science classes. Awesome, very cool. Welcome, welcome. Last midterm was Compute 175, U of A, first year computer science student specializing in software practice. Very cool. Very nice. Cool. Welcome. Loving this in the polls. I see. I'm loving this. I'm seeing the have you participated in research? We have almost a 60% of no, but I want to. That's great. Then you're in the right place. That's perfect. Uh, what most appealed to you about this session? I don't know much about computing research, and this looks informative. With the second, I'm still deciding computing research for me. Will hopefully will help. University of Alberta last midterm was on heuristic search algorithms. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Maybe we'll just give it like another few seconds for people to, to put in their last minute responses if you haven't already. Cool. I think we could probably, I think we probably go ahead and get started. Um, I don't know if Christine, if you wanted to All right. yeah. get us started. So yeah, so let's Get started. Sorry, like Excuse the poll me. is right in front of me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multiple choice, but it, this, this, this survey asks to a single choice. Which one is it? The survey. Uh, the there, was, survey. there was a poll that was just showing on Zoom. Um, so that, that was the one that we were talking about, like the little poll that was showing on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was it. If you, if you click the response to that, then you're good to go. That's what I did. Oh, perfect. Okay. Perfect. And you're great. Awesome. Perfect. So yeah, so let's let's get started. So just as a disclaimer, before we get started, we just wanted to let you know that this workshop is being recorded and it is made available for information and educational purposes. So we're using it within the organization. The CRA does not make any representation or warranties with respect to the accuracy, applicability, fitness, or completeness of, of the contents. And that the information contained in this workshop represents the views and opinions of the individuals and not necessarily represent the views or opinions of CRA or any of the organizations that our speakers or participants are affiliated with. All right. So to give you, you know, a quick intro before we jump in into this session. So this is our second session of this workshop workshop series. And this is part of the UR2 PhD program with the objective of increasing access to undergraduate research. So you're all in the right place. 
feel like this is amazing. Perfect fit. Um, the UR2 PhD program does multiple program activities. And one of the pillars of this program is the workshop series that you're now attending. Uh, they're basically monthly workshops. They're all virtual, like you're noticing. And we have four of them. This is the second in the sequence where to this month's topic is about what does a career in computing research look like? And then the next two that are coming up in April and May are about how will my research change the world and how do I combine my other interests with computing? So quickly, just the quick introductions to the team. So there's a lot that goes on in the background, but you know, right now we have the three of us here with you. We're the design facilitators, myself and Nima um, Shiri, and um, of course, Julia, amazing. We could not do anything without Julia. Like, we cannot, it wouldn't happen, uh, who's the program associate helping with almost everything. If you have questions about UR2 PhD or the workshop series, please feel free to email, um, you know, the email that you see in front of you, send an email to the account if you have any questions. All right, and I guess I'll hand it off to you, Nima. Awesome, yeah, so I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speakers. So uh, we have an awesome panel of folks that are gonna kind of reflect on their experiences and answer some questions that we have pre-prepared and also answer some questions that you all are gonna ask um, so just to kind of quickly introduce our guest speakers, uh, first is Dr. Lexi Yang, uh, who is a research scientist in GeoAI group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, her research interests focus on advancing high-performance machine learning approaches for large-scale data analysis, and she currently leads automated imagery analytics with large-scale multimodality geospatial data. Uh, the recent work from her team has been widely used to support national-scale disaster response and management, uh, and management by agencies. Uh, she received her PhD in civil engineering and statistics certificate in applied statistics from Purdue University in 2014. Uh, thank you for joining us, Lexi. And then next is Dr. George Porter. So George Porter is a professor in the Systems and Networking Group in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UC San Diego. Uh, he's the co-director of the Center for Network Systems and a co-founder of InFocus Networks. Uh, he has received a Google Focused Research Award, a NetApp Faculty Fellowship, and the NSF Career Award. He obtained his PhD from the Rad Lab in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department at UC Berkeley. And before that, he received his undergraduate degree from UT Austin. So yeah, thank you for joining us, George. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Donna Nachmanson, uh, who is a senior bioinformatics scientist at Twin Strand Biosciences in Seattle. Uh, initially focusing on wet lab methodologies at the University of Washington, she later shifted her focus to bioinformatics and she completed her PhD at the University of California, San Diego in 2022. Uh, her collaboration with Twin Strand Biosciences during her PhD led to her joining the company, uh, where she now researches novel applications of duplex sequencing in collaboration with various sectors, including academia, industry, pharma, and government. So yeah, thank you, Donna, for joining us. Amazing. So welcome, everyone. Um, just to give you a quick, quick summary of the agenda today, you know, we already started with with we started with a quick um, poll. We're going to then move, transition to an icebreaker and then talk about, you know, in some information about real life applications of research in the different aspects of life where the like like jobs and, you know, research versus, you know, labs versus industry and so on. And then we will have a very, you know, cool, interesting discussion with our panelists and well, they will share their experiences and their expertise. And then at the end, we'll end with a what's next, what's gonna happen next month with a quick survey. All right, with that, we'll start our first activity. Awesome, yeah, so our first activity, we just wanna get an idea of what folks' preconceived notions might be about some of the topics we're gonna talk about. So uh, we have a QR code on the screen. I'm also gonna post the direct link in the chat for folks who that might be easier for them. Um, basically, we're gonna have an icebreaker activity uh, asking you to answer a handful of questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let me steal your screen share real quick. Yeah, I was gonna. Um, so hopefully folks are able to see um, my screen with the poll and go ahead. So the first question we have is just, what is computing research? So, uh, you know, in a word or two, feel free to just post your ideas of what do you think computing research is and that your responses are going to automatically bubble up. So just a handful of words, what is computing research? So we're seeing some discovery, algorithms, math, AI, data. Okay, nice. Discovering new information, intricate details, innovation. I like that. Oh, networks, that's good. Oh, algorithms. Now algorithms is getting all big. I love the research on AI data. Very cool, very cool. We have like 21 responses so far. Feel free to 
to jump in and, and folks can also vote existing ones. So we're seeing a lot of emphasis on algorithms, a little bit on optimization and innovation. AI is up there, definitely a hot topic right now. Applications. I see the, the one that's secretly very important. We got money <laughs> going on. That's, that's always an important one. It's always what we struggle with in, in academia, trying to find ways to fund our research. Oh, so let me uh, let me disable that. There we go. Maybe I'll give it like another five or so seconds. Oh, uh, and then someone mentioned the chat, but you can also just type in the poll. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll post a link to the poll again. Um, cool. So I think we're we're getting the gist of it. So there's a lot of algorithms at play, innovation uh, behind the scenes. We have a lot of like math, statistics. There's a lot of trial and error that's going into it. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Um, let's jump over to the next question. So the next question that we have is where do computing researchers work? So, you know, maybe feel free to describe a company, feel free to describe uh, an industry, maybe like tech industry, biotech industry, finance industry, just like what, what do you imagine is a location or a discipline that a computing researcher works in? Universities, that's a big one. Academia, everywhere. Microsoft, that's a very popular company, absolutely. Labs, university, post-secondary. Quinstrand, that's a good... <laughs> I don't know if Donna put that or if someone in the audience did, but <laughs> that is somewhere that a computing researcher does indeed work. Uh, everywhere, supercomputer center, remotely. So that, that's an interesting one. So remotely, so kind of this notion that we might not be bound by physical locations. We might be able to work on computing research remotely. R&D, FAIR, everywhere. Perfect. Yeah, maybe I'll give it another few seconds. We have like 34 responses. I love it. Perfect. So university seems to be the one that people are most familiar with. Uh, but folks have also mentioned some... Tech companies, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Qualcomm, uh, some labs. Awesome. Cool. Maybe I'll go ahead and end this poll. So perfect. And then the last poll that we want to just kind of get an idea of what folks think is what does computing research look like day to day? So not just where you work, but like, what do you imagine a computing researcher does? Do they program a lot? Do they respond to a lot of emails? Do they have meetings? Kind of, oh, drinking coffee, that's a good one. <laughs> that is a, yeah. a lot of coffee, desk job, <laughs> read, reading lots of papers, looking at data, Googling. I've got my Google flu skills pretty good, I hope. A lot of people are saying coding, reading papers, waiting for stuff to run. Yeah, that's a good one. Debugging, emailing coworkers. I think I'm drowning in my inbox. That's a big one. Math. Excel, debug, babysitting, computation. Yeah, I got to make sure that it didn't crash. Mentorship, that's a good one. Yeah, very good. Using Slack. I'm a Discord fan myself, but all my collaborators use Slack. So I have like four different accounts. Experimenting. Awesome. Maybe I'll give it like another five or six seconds. Slack is slightly more professional. Discord changed my mind. I would argue Discord is more professional because I can have bots to automate stuff. So. I don't know. Who knows? Spicy, spicy takes, Bastion. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So I'll go ahead and end this poll. So, so we wanted to just get an idea of without us influencing you too much, what do folks think? Um, Christine, do you want to share the slides again? Then we'll, we'll go, we'll go yeah, over sure. uh, a couple, couple specific examples. So we, we actually, we took some data that we wanted to kind of pre-prepare. So uh, Computing Research Association, the group that's organizing these workshops, actually had done a survey where they asked a bunch of new PhD recipients where they find themselves working. And surprisingly, so the most frequent response that the audience provided was universities, which is a very important trajectory that PhDs in computing research go. But actually, almost 70% of new PhD recipients in a computing field one into industry. Um, on the other hand, like tenure track research faculty was roughly 7.7% teaching faculty. So I'm a teaching professor. I think Christine, is yours also a teaching focused role or are you ladder rank faculty? 
No, ours is more, it's kind of like a research institute, but in a liberal arts setting. Ah, so it's I a see. mix, it's a half and half. So we're looking at like maybe 10-ish percent then across those types of positions. Yeah. Um, so actually the majority of people do go into industry. Um, so we're hoping that with, with that kind of context, we have some, some panelists that kind of span all the different areas that you might be able to go into. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was actually surprising to me as well. I didn't realize how much was industry. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, feel free to go to the next 70, one. Yeah. So then when we ask where do computing researchers work, a lot of you also mentioned some specific companies or like types of industries. So the second figure is showing out of that slice of the original pie of people that went into industry, what types of industry jobs do they have? So a lot of computing research PhDs go into research focused jobs. A lot of them actually do go into like non-research focused jobs. So some of them go into marketing. I know at like Illumina, a lot of their marketing teams have PhDs. Illumina is a big sequencing company, um, but they have PhDs because they have to understand the technology and the research that can be done with it to be able to market it to appropriate people that might be able to use it. Um, you might go into project management. There's all sorts of positions that you can go into uh, that are not necessarily research, even in industry. Um, so my hopeful takeaway is that, you know, maybe some of those preconceived notions that you might have had, maybe we can actually expand a little bit and, um, you know, maybe show you that there's a lot of different options for what you could do with a potential PhD down the line and a lot of different research type positions in industry. Yep. Yep. And that's perfect. And going off from that point, just to show you, we just pulled up for you just three examples. So these are three different ads job ads from industry. Yes, we know that university is there, but notice how industry is really, there's like more, it seems like more people are going into industry. So we wanted to show you uh, what types of jobs these are. Please forgive me as I try and figure out what I'm doing here. Okay, there we go. Um, it's been a while since I've used Zoom and my mouse is not working. Here we go. Um, so over here, uh, the first one I'm showing you is from Lincoln Labs at MIT. So let's just, our goal of this exercise is just to walk you through those job descriptions. So those are pretty recent calls. Um, I think they're still open. So, you know, if you know any PhDs, you know, like I think they're still open or masters and look at the, the description. So this is for MIT Lincoln Lab, which is um, a very um, big research lab that is here in the Boston area. Um, it, they typically get their funding. So yes, they're associated with MIT, but most of their funding comes from DARPA or the, and the government. So they got, they have tons and tons and tons of amazing projects. And this is a job that is part of the surveillance systems group. So this is how you read the description. You first know which group is the one that's hiring. And this is how you would know whether this fits your research area or not. And then you go a little bit into the job description and notice the job description. They're looking for people, applicants with interest and background in applied engineering, modeling, and simulation and machine learning to support the developments of algorithms and systems for autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles. So that kind of gives you a general idea of what research field, who, which researchers are they looking for? What topic were they working on? And notice that I love that the word algorithms is there. So like that was like the biggest word, I think, in the word cloud when we did in the first question. And then you transition into the requirements. And I don't know if I need to zoom in a little bit, but look at the requirements. You'll notice that in some of these jobs, the PhD is actually required. Uh, so PhD in engineering, physics, math, or computer science, or similar fields. And sometimes, a PhD is not necessary, but in lieu of a PhD, you can get your master's with four years of relevant experience. And relevant experience here in the setup means research-related experience, something that was related to research. And then they describe more about what is it that they expect you to know, like what, what skills do they expect you know you to have, and what is it that they would, they're looking for. And then they add more for desired qualifications. And this is how you know this job is set up. So you can, with a PhD, you can apply. With a master's in experience, you can apply. Now, moving on to the second job. This is another job that is a research scientist in Microsoft Research. So Microsoft Research is also one of the, you know, it's, it's one of those entities. Microsoft has a huge research setup that is a part of the corporate that does not get involved with the products that they're building. Some things they build sometimes turn into products, but it's very separate from the you know, the engineering side of things of Microsoft, and they have different opportunities. And look at this. 
the work site, up to 100% work from home from those who said remote research is remote. Well, yes, some jobs are fully remote. And what they're looking for is the profession. They're looking for research applied in data science. So that's like the highlight here. First keyword is research. And again, an overview. They talk about, you know, what is Microsoft research? They talk about their group. So it is part their the group that is hiring is the responsible and open AI research team in Azure Cogn Cognitive Services. So it's kind of in the the AI section within their cloud computing services. And then they describe as a research scientist, this is how, this is what you'll be doing. This is what you'll be advancing. This is the contribution that you'll be doing to society. And then they go on to qualifications. Notice this job. This job is a research scientist. So the requirements are really master's degree in a relevant field and one year related research experience. So it's a little bit, it's, it's more, I'm not gonna say entry level, but it's kind of a, an entry level for a master's student or a PhD student or equivalent experience. So PhD might be more qualified actually sometimes. Yep. PhD would apply here. And then they go into other requirements, which is the ability to meet Microsoft customer and or government security screening requirements. Some of those jobs require, you know, certain extra um, background clearance and clearance stuff. Now, last but not least, this is the third type of job that we wanted to show you, which is part of Illumina, which is just Nima would just mentioned. So in this job, I really like this. So again, another flavor of a research job and I can't zoom in into this one, so please forgive me, you guys. Uh, this is a principal electrical engineer. So this is not an entry-level job in any way. This is a principal electrical engineer, and it is about, again, it's a research position. The seeking, the position summary, so again, Illumina is talking about, you know, who they are and how their work, you know, like the, how they impact the world and how their solutions are, you know, they help um, the community and society. And then the position summary is that they're seeking highly motivated self-driven individuals to join who? The electrical engineering team at their San Diego design facility. And they'll be part of that award-winning team that is doing cutting edge development of sequencing instruments. So that is right away, you know, that that's a research position. Responsibilities, leading and designing the design and development. So again, this is a principal position. So this is a, you know, a more advanced position. What are the requirements for this? If we go over here, I'm looking for the part that education wise, BS and MS, so bachelor's or master's in electrical engineering or related field with notice how many years of experience, 15 years plus experience. But why are we showing you this job to show you that or you can have a PhD with eight plus industry experience. So in so many situations, your PhD doesn't necessarily mean that you can only go into academia. PhD can count as years of experience because you are learning tons of stuff during your PhD that are not necessarily just focused on your narrow research area. All right, so this is what I wanted to show you guys. And now I'm gonna, unfortunately, because I did a little tiny hiccup with the, um, sorry, I'm gonna get back to this. I'm trying to get back to the slides. There we go. I'm going to put this slide back in that window. There we go. Can we see the slides again? All right. Here we go. Um, so just to yeah, kind of wrap this up, there's so many jobs out there. And if you're looking for, you know, research related jobs, here are the places that you can go find jobs. And these are all, I mean, in all of these websites, you can always just type in the keyword research or in the area of research that you're interested in, and you'll find the related job. Um, additional resources that we also wanted to share with all of you since you're undergrads, I mean, you're probably not looking for a full-time job yet. Uh, since you're still undergrads, we wanted to share with you resources about the opportunities our EUs. If you want to get started, if you want to be involved in undergraduate research, know that you have our EU opportunities, you know, for different, offered by different institutions. DRA also has the distributed research experiences for undergrads. Um, and there's more information that you can find in the CRA student pathways into research computing page, as well as pathways into science opportunities. So take a look at those. And, you know, if you're excited about something, you know, definitely, definitely explore them and never hesitate from emailing people and asking them questions whenever you want to. All right. And I guess with that, we'll transition to our panel. Perfect. So yeah, so uh, thank you so much, panelists, for joining us. Um, and we could probably stop screen share for this part just so that everyone can see yes. all exactly. the panelists. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much for joining us. So just to get us started, we have a few pre-prepared questions. Uh, folks in the audience, feel free to kind of think of any questions that you might spin off based on this discussion. Uh, and you know, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll kind of address them as they come. Um, so maybe just to get us started, um, 
what does your day look like, each of you at work? Like how, how does your daily work life work? You know, what do you work on? What typical things do you do? Um, and maybe all three of you can answer this one, but um, you know, maybe whoever is ready, I can I can kind of like call on folks. Or you can also just unmute whenever you're ready. So what, what does a day look like in, in each of your professions? Yeah, Donna, go for it. I don't know if that smile meant you were ready or. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can't unmute. Sorry. Uh, let me, there we go. Let me see if I can. I think you should be good now. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Sorry. sorry I'm, glad you, I'm glad you read my. <laughs> my hand sign there. Same way, same way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'd say on a uh, on a weekly basis, um, I have a couple days a week that are set aside for meetings, and that'll be meetings with my team, meetings with my um, uh, director, uh, and then meeting with collaborators um, if we're working on a particular manuscript. Um, I'll usually set aside you know, a couple of days a week that are primarily meetings. And then the rest of the days are, are pretty much devoted to um, working on um, projects that I'm assigned to. Um, so as a, as a research scientist, I, um, my primary role is to uh, pretty much get all the data and analyze and present um, these, uh, these projects to our clients. And that can be, um, I think I mentioned my bio, that can be uh, from kind of anywhere, it could be, you know, government related clients or other pharma companies or, or in coordination with labs. We have some labs in UCSD we've worked with as well. Um, so those will be primarily kind of data analysis days, maybe a bit of coding if I need, um, um, like a little bit of algorithmic work, a little bit of functions, um, doing some, um, some stuff I, I don't usually do, but, um, primarily those days are, are data analysis and then, um, documenting what I'm doing. So a few meeting days and then a few kind of head down, nobody bother me in my cave, in my hobbit hole <laughs> uh, days. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, and by the way, panelists, we have added you as co-hosts, so you should be able to unmute yourself now, hopefully. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing, Donna. I don't know, George or Lexi, do either of you want to go next? Yeah, Lexi, go for it. Yeah, I can start with my day-to-day uh, -day activities so i enjoy coding so even though that my current major responsibilities are more like uh cultivating sponsor relationships and try to understand what's the client's uh, needs i try to secure maybe 20 percent of my time do a lot of coding debugging and try to implement in some of my thoughts because i feel like that's my my only the, the only way I can control like what is the outcome that I can get and it's also a very uh, rewarding pro uh, experiences to me so I try to secure maybe 20% of time doing that maybe someday I get lucky I can do more about that and do research papers so I enjoy doing that uh, so I mentioned that uh, maybe 20 20% or 30% of sometimes it's just all day meetings and uh, with my teammates, um, assign work and also uh, discuss with them what are their roadblocks in their research paths or uh, production runs. So we try to have this kind of meeting with the group. So everybody, everybody is um, on the same page of which part of the uh, workflow or project they are at and eventually uh, because most of our projects are very collaborative. So we wanted to make sure uh, everyone is working their things, but everyone is also aware of uh, uh, what are people are doing. So try not to reinvent in the wheels or rediscover issues once again, again. So meetings definitely take a big chunk of my time uh, doing that. So that's pretty much uh, my day-to-day -day activities, uh, coding, reading, research papers, meetings, uh, that kind of things. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. And uh, how about George? Do you want to share as well? Sure. So um, hi, everyone. I'm George. Um, so I'm a professor at a big research university, a state university. Um, and so a lot of my, some of my day is um, spent doing 
if you're an undergraduate, what you s experience the most, which is teaching. So I teach big lecture courses and big giant lecture halls that are mostly empty because we like video record the classes now. And I'm on Piazza and sending emails back and forth and all of that kind of stuff, meeting with my TAs, meeting with students in office hours and things like that. Um, but then actually the bulk of my time, maybe that's 25% of my time, something like that. A large amount of my time is spent working really closely with my PhD students. So I think we'll probably talk about like what a PhD is and what that, what hopefully you're getting a sense of that. But that includes um, looking at data, pitching ideas, talking about roadblocks, you know, meeting as a group to figure out, okay, we got this paper coming up, you know, how is the data collection going? Oh, I'm running into the snag. Someone's like, oh, you know, you should try this, that kind of stuff, looking at code together. So collaborating on things, writing papers, reviewing, you know, that kind of thing. And then um, there's, depending on the time of the year, you know, academia at least, um, somewhat unlike industry, is very seasonal in that there's a time when you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to recruit students to join your group. And so you're like talking to students and looking at applications and stuff like that. Um, there's seasons where you're maybe applying for funding, which is a really important job where we have to get funding to support our students because unlike a company where the you think you might think if I join so and so's group, the university will pay for them. But unfortunately, that is not how it works. Uh, the faculty are responsible for getting funding, generally speaking, as a broad rule, to support their research, buy their equipment, all that kind of stuff. And that's all inside the university. You're also trying to mentor your students so that they can build a professional network and they, you know, you're trying to do all that stuff for them. And then finally, there's kind of things that are the broader public. Um, so right now I'm on this meeting uh, here. Uh, a week ago, I did a podcast, like a kind of cloud computing technical podcast. Um, sometimes you'll give a statement to a journalist who's working on a particular area that is interested in talking with someone. And so there's all these kind of interesting, different little things you can be doing. You go to conferences, um, all of that kind of stuff. So um, there's a lot of different aspects to this to this job. And one of the fun things I like, and then I'll wrap up, is just that um, you end up meeting with lots of different people. You know, you could meet with academic administrators, you could meet with staff, you could meet with fellow faculty, your PhD students, your undergrads. Uh, I had a high school student visit who was interested in it, being an undergrad. And even though I don't have anything to do with admitting undergrads, you know, I talked to him for a while, stuff like that. So you end up talking to a lot of interesting people. I'll put it that way. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's, yeah, uh, quite a breadth of, of stuff that you have to do a lot of hats. But um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fulfilling interactions as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you folks for, for kind of giving us some, some insights into that. Um, I think the next question, uh, so I, I saw Donna also already answered a little bit of it, but maybe I'll also just ask it for the whole panel. Um, that's, that's perfect. Um, so, so basically our first kind of general question is, you know, how did you end up in the position or industry that you're currently in and like what factors led you down that route? And maybe as part of that, just to kind of touch on the question that was in the chat, um, how did you know that a PhD was the right decision for you, I guess, along that trajectory? Uh, and this one might be a little bit more in-depth of a <laughs> question, so feel free to take your time to think. Yeah, so what, what led you here? What factors did you consider? I can answer because I guess I already put together an answer on the, on the Q&A. So I'll just pretty much say what I said on there. I initially had no idea what I wanted to do when I finished my undergraduate because my undergrad was all biochemistry. I thought I was going to go to med school. Then I shadowed some, you know, cl clinicians and I really didn't like the hospital. Um, and I started taking some computer science in my senior year and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Why, why is this so late in my degree? Um, so I was, I was in a kind of a position I didn't know what to do. So I, I applied to some research positions. I like cleaned mouse cages and washed dishes and did some wet lab work. Um, and then uh, I think during that time is when I talked to so many people, I saw other folks in other labs doing bioinformatics and started doing that in my own lab too. Um, I think for me, a big factor was cost. I didn't want to pay for another degree um, in, in computer science. And I, I, and I, you know, so that would be like undergrad and masters would all probably cost a lot of money. Um, and then 
uh, I still was really interested in research and not just a primarily computing career. So there's a lot of um, software engineer positions that are, you know, uh, working on applications, you know, Expedia and um, kind of Amazon based. I mean, there's there's research, of course, there too. But there's also a lot of like very non-research related um, uh uh, careers there. And I wanted to do something that was health related, biotech related. So that was really important to me. And that was the other factor there. But at first I really didn't know what to do. So if you are, are you know, feeling lost, just talk to as many people as you can and try as many things as you can, because it's, it's tough. It's really tough. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. I was in a similar boat. I was, I was pre-med once upon a time too. That's how it goes. Um, yeah, Lexi, please go for it. Yeah, I might get start with uh, why I'm get. I was uh, going for PhD. Um, I think at that time when I was uh, graduating from my master programs, I was uh, my master thesis uh, topic was about neural networks with a specific uh, signal processing kind of uh, uh, variations. And at that time, I was truly fascinated by the things I was doing, and I feel. Even I got my thesis turning and then I got a degree, but I feel like, oh, I tried to do lost like, oh, let's see, you got disconnected there for a little bit. And my back? Yes. Okay. Where I was at? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say that I was uh, getting continue after my master degree because uh, I feel like I want to do, do more, right? And that's uh, where I learned my, uh, I got a, a PhD offer at Purdue. And fortunately the, the advisor uh, that I, I communicated with also was interested in pursuing a machine learning with the uh, remote sensing data, which was pretty new at that at that time, so I was able to continue this path. And then at that time I was thinking, okay, after my uh, PhD, I'm definitely going back to Taiwan, which where I was from and maybe do a professor and teaching because at that time I also enjoy teaching. And after, after I got my PhD and there are many, uh, I mean, any, uh, a lot of opportunities expose me to uh, do things that, that beyond um, doing, uh, being a tenure track professors. So one of the uh, opportunities I got connected to is this, uh, uh, the, the job posting that I, I saw at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And that, that was a, just a small group, but it's a group that with the very focused uh, remote sensing geospatial related um, topics. And then I got into several seminars and uh, we talked. Uh, I talked to some people I knew at the lab and get to know better about what the things they are doing. And it's kind of uh, aligned with my goal or my thoughts that what I try to apply the things I learned in my PhD to do, to contribute to something that is actually um, being used by some people. So National Laboratory provide this space, say that um, we work with government agencies because they have uh, real life problems that presented to us. And then we need to come up with the solutions or work with government agencies and provide them some tools or some data sets that they can utilize to support um, or solve the, the problems that government, government agencies have. So that's why I went into this lab and, as a postdoc and I really like the things I'm, I was doing as a postdoc and eventually I stay in, that's uh, eight years of my life there. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing your journey. That's exciting. So kind of like all sorts of different options. And then you ended up wanting to do like the practical, like, you know, have like big picture problems that the government is having that you can solve. That's awesome. It's cool to see that computing research can be applied to those. Um, and then George, I don't know if, if you wanted to also share what got sure. you. Sure. Well, so one of the reasons I wanted to get a PhD was my mom. So my mom's a nurse and she's uh, got a PhD in nursing. 
And she um, was a practicing nurse, but also as a professor at Houston Community College. So she was a community college professor. So I had some sort of secondhand knowledge of, of what academic life was like. And when I was at UT Austin as an undergrad, I just loved, I just loved it. I loved school, loved college. It was fantastic. I just loved it. And so I remember um, looking every time I'd get a textbook, I'd like flip through it. I'd be like, I can't believe that in 15 weeks, this is going to make sense to me because it's all just so confusing right now. But I would also do that with the schedule. And there were these like mystery classes way in the back of the list of classes that were like graduate doctoral courses. And they looked even more cool and stuff like that. So I was really excited about going to grad school. Um, and I did really well in my coursework, but I started um, visiting my professor's office hours and just chatting honestly with them and kind of got to know them um, and ended up doing research um, with Jay Strother Moore, who was like my undergrad mentor. And it was on automatic theorem proving and formal formal modeling and formal specifications. Um, and so this was not something I was particularly interested in. I mean, I was interested to learn about it, but it was just sort of um, an opportunity. And I and I liked the process of doing research and seeing the research group and working on a, a thing and stuff like that. And so that led to some firsthand experience really being involved in research. And so I that really enabled me that that experience that I had made me sort of legible to a variety of doctoral programs. And so I, I went straight from undergrad to the PhD program um, and I went to Berkeley. Uh, and what I will say is that one common misconception a lot of people have is that you have to get an explicit master's degree before you can apply for a PhD. That's not true. You can, that's one path, but you can also go directly from undergrad to a, a PhD program. Um, and so then but I ended up doing um, networking. So like building, you know, networked applications, network systems, network protocols, that kind of thing. So the other thing I wanted to share is just that my undergrad experience with formal specifications and automatic theorem proving has completely nothing to do with what I wanted to do in grad school. But it was actually fine because I think people got a sense like, okay, you know, elite, like one bar you want to clear when you're applying for grad school is to say like, I know what research actually is. And I know that it is it is not more undergrad. So it's like a completely different thing. Like they both happen at a university or a college, but they're very different. And so a lot of what people are looking for is to get kind of get a sense that like, I sort of know what this is and that's, I'm really interested in that. So that's something that really helped me. And um, yeah, and so then I ended up, you know, getting um, getting work in networking, which is what I work in now. So I'm kind of an internet data center networking person. And um, it's funny though, uh, I, the last thing I'll say is that the formal modeling and automatic and theorem proving, I was like, you know, I don't quite, this is not for me. Like, I respect this. This is amazing that people can do this, but this just isn't quite for me. So sometimes research experiences can kind of tell you what you're not super interested in, um, but uh, everything you learn helps you in the future at some point. So it's, it's not lost time. It was actually quite exciting. Well, that's, so that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective, George. You really thank you all panelists for this. So like actually that kind of takes us to, I mean, something that we were like, the three of you have touched on. They have a very excellent question in the Q&A about what type of resources prepared you for to start research. So like when you, in your first research experience, if you were jumping into, or if you're going into a master's program or a PhD program, what would help more? And the question here is specifying, is it classwork? Is it self-study? Is it that I have to really be involved in a research lab in order to be able to go into those programs? What are your, what is your advice for a student? I can take out first. <laughs> I think a class class works definitely are very important. Um, I'm talking about if you are interested in doing the research perspective, because uh, you you try you definitely would like to have your foundations built well. Like crossworks are a good at least they are good resources that provide you that kind of space. And also, I mean a lot of assignments team projects, you can definitely learn a lot from uh, just attending uh, class cl classes and taking those credits. And then my 
some of the things I got, uh, I got, I got pretty good uh, um, experiences from probably was also talking to uh, different professors and also maybe going to some of the uh, recruiting events, try to understand what's going on out there. And as a student, you kind of have this privilege that you can ask anything without being uh, embarrassed because your students, you are giving that space. So ask away what kind of things you are interested in just to be bold in some time, sometimes you will be surprised. Uh, there are some good connections, opportunities you, you, you will have. And if you are doing PhD, then of course, uh, work closely with your advisor is probably also my advice because um, she or he will help you to determine a good a research topic. Um, they have been in this field for many, many years. So they have seen a lot of, uh, um, directions or possible, um, they can offer some ex experiences. Uh, maybe George can also share that being an advisor, what, what can you, what can tell uh, you, what, what you can, what, what can you offer to the, 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 the students? Yeah, sorry, this is my cat Tippy who's joining the panel. I think she's, she's <laughs> saying hi to everyone. Um, uh, sometimes a, a, a dog or cat can help you uh, do something. Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So I I do think that coursework is important. Um, th there's a re so there's a real fundamental difference between research and and formal coursework, in my opinion. And in a in a class that you take, you know, it's very clear you're going to have chapter one is on this topic, and chapter and then we're going to have a midterm, and you have four projects, and it's it's sort of a, a course of study that's designed to be traversed by many people, essentially. And generally speaking, it all kind of snaps together and, and it's clear then that you've succeeded. Like I got an 89 on the final or whatever, you know. In research, it's it's a lot different and it's much more creative. Um, not that coursework or curriculum design isn't creative, but there's a creativity that's about taking ideas and putting them together to build something new. And I was thinking about this actually, I was as I was thinking about this panel that we were gonna be on, I, I'm a big movie buff and last night was the Oscars. So I was watching the Oscars last night and I was thinking in a way, you know, bear with me on this analogy, it's a little strained, but it's research is in a way kind of like making a movie where you're bringing together different people that all have their own expertise, costuming or acting or sound or whatever. And in a lot of ways, by watching a lot of movies, you sort of understand how to tell a story in a way that's compelling or interesting. And there's different styles of movies, like action movies, historical dramas, whatever. And it's like that with research too. Like there are measurement papers where you're really just measuring something and you're trying to understand how do people interact with something. Or there's theory papers, like in the, the, the quiz or you know, the, the survey earlier. Um, in systems research, you know, a lot of what we do is sort of about um, coming up with new abstractions and sort of understanding how you can build systems that have certain properties based on those abstractions. And so um, I, I actually kind of thinking back to the kind of original question of like, what are the things that can help you kind of launch into research? I think creativity is super important, as is not limiting yourself to the coursework. It's important to to do well in your courses, but but sort of if you have an opportunity to be involved in research, either in like a formal program that your school or like informally, something like that, you can start to develop this creativity where you start having to learn about things because you're going to later on kind of put them together in ways that nobody's ever put them together for before. And so this is kind of a piece of advice I give, which is that it's better you don't have to always work directly with faculty. So there's a lot of researchers at a university and a lot of those people are grad students in research groups, PhD students, master's students, sometimes undergrads. And sometimes you can offer to help them out. Like, hey, I know you're doing a data analysis project. Do you need help with something? Or like, uh, you're doing all this big data collection. Can I help write scripts to kind of organize the data or something like that? So by helping sometimes students on the project, that's a way to kind of get involved in a way that you're not going directly to the professor saying, I'd like to do research. You know, you're, you're getting kind of involved in that way. So that could be super helpful. Um, and, you know, 
it is not always that get you know getting an A plus in every single class is not like um, the door to being a researcher, in my opinion. Like you really want to you know you want to do the best you can, obviously, but but it's about kind of building on your formal coursework rather than expecting that formal coursework to necessarily do everything you're going to want to do to be a researcher because not everyone is wants to be a researcher so you know there, there's some things there so that's my thought okay the answer so far has been, have been so nice <laughs> i'm not sure you can add anything better on here um but uh no i i definitely agree with with everything that's been said so far um coursework will only take you so far there's no perfect set of preparations that you can do I think just getting your your toes wet with some kind of form of research just so you get a feel for you know what it's like to kind of you know fail in <laughs> uh in, in what you're researching and um or or kind of th there's a little bit of like clouds that you sometimes go through when you're trying to answer a question or develop a uh uh, a model, um, you know, there's a little bit of fuzziness because no one's ever done what you're doing. Um, so it's not in a class. Um, and so sometimes you might need to go backwards. So start on your research project and find that actually, you know, this class would have been really helpful. Maybe I'll, um, I'll, I'll do that a little bit. Uh, Self-study was mentioned on here too. Um, maybe I'll go down and take some time and read, you know, a bunch of papers on this specific topic um, that I wouldn't have thought of to do before uh, embarking on this research, but, um, kind of like a, kind of like a, um, kind of starting the research and going back and, and doing those preparation or, or, or those additional things that are, are needed. But, um, yeah, getting, getting your toes wet, however you can is, is really important because yeah, you, you might enjoy it and you might, might not. And that's important to, to figure out. Um, and I see George has his hands up. Oh, I just wanted you, you just said something that I thought was really interesting. <laughs> and I just wanted to add a small comment on that, which yeah, is that um, when pa papers, uh, research papers are very important, but it's very hard to get in started because it's kind of like joining um, a, a lunch conversation, a bunch of, among a bunch of, among a bunch of like work coworkers, and you don't quite know who they're talking about. And like, who's Susan and what's going on with Mike over there, you know, whatever it's like, and you're because like the papers all refer to each other. And so sometimes it's hard to get started. But one thing you can do that costs zero dollars um, that 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 doesn't require a formal program or anything is if you're in a class, just an undergrad, go to office hours and, and ask the faculty member, ask your, your instructor and say, hey, in this field that we're like this class, what are the three or four papers you think are like the best papers in this field? Because I'm just curious, I'd like to look at them and then just print them out and kind of like, over coffee, just scan them. And you don't have to understand everything, but I, I guarantee that they will have thoughts, you know, on like, oh, if you're, if I could only read three papers from this field, what, what are those three papers like? And you get a sense of the different style of research, different kind of research, that kind of thing. That's perfect. Thank you. That was, I, I love this. It was great. Uh, it's like, it's about research. It's about exploring the unknown. So there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, it's really like, no matter what you do, you're just learning little skills along the way. And then once you get into it, you realize what more you need to learn, which takes us to now actually that it's a great segue to the next question. What is something you wished you did differently or sooner in your PhD journey? If there is, or it could be, you can generalize this to PhD or even like after, like something that you wish you've done differently or sooner. Okay, I'll start. Um, so, um, my my grad. So my time as a PhD student, um, I learned a ton, and I had a very supportive um, advisor. But I had I did struggle quite a bit with research. And in fact, when I graduated, I wanted to be an academic. I wanted to be a professor, and I went on the market, and I got zero interviews. So uh, I have a somewhat serpentine entrance into academia, which is that I went on the market, got zero job interviews. Um, and then my wife, I girlfriend then, now wife, um, she got a, a job offer as a professor here in San Diego in theater. Um, so I followed her. So I, I went into industry for a year and a half. Um, I still loved research though. And so ended up deciding to 
go back into a postdoc and that sort of led to another opportunity another opportunity which kind of led me to where i am now so i'm extremely lucky and i feel really happy about that but one of the, the reasons i struggled in grad school was i was working alone a lot and um there was a couple of years where I was doing like my own work and I was, it's not like I was antisocial. I was just, I was just kind of working on this project and it's kind of my own thing. And later on in my PhD, I ended up just kind of for fun, this, this lab mate, Rodrigo Fonseca, who's now like a principal director at Microsoft research. We were like having coffee or something and chatting. And I was like, what are you working on? Like, can I help you? Like, I don't know. I'm stuck on my project. I'd like, like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm thinking. And so we started working together. And that led to some really positive work and that built and built, et cetera. And I did that really late into the thing, but I realized, you know, you don't have to necessarily own a project to be a re you can sort of help someone out, talk to someone, walk down the hallway. This is why I think being on zoom all the time is not necessarily ideal um, for everyone, because sometimes you walk down the hallway and you see, you hear some people talking and they're, and you're like, oh, I know about that. Or you can contribute to something kind of serendipitously. But what, what I would say is that if I could go back, I would try to be involved. You can't be involved in 20 projects, but maybe like two, like where I have a primary one that I'm like 80% in charge of, but maybe I'm doing a 20% on someone else's. And like that can help widen your social network a little bit, widen your professional network it lets you see other people working you learn a lot that way so trying to collaborate a little bit more even if it's just for fun or just whatever can be helpful and i wish i'd done that earlier i love that thank you thank you for sharing next year donna uh i mine's along similar veins of of interacting with with more more folks on, on their projects i um I think in the last last year of my PhD was contributing like small little bits of analysis to other projects. And it's so interesting how it actually made me more motivated because sometimes working on your own singular project and especially if you're in a stuck place, it can just be a little bit of fresh blood moving, <laughs> moving through your brain and, um, you know, you it takes you out of, out of a kind of a, a repetitive kind of cycle. Um, so it, yeah, that was also in person. Um, so <laughs> that aspect of, of, um, of, of, you know, interacting with other folks, I, I do think was really important during the PhD time. And so there, there was other grad students that I ended up working with and that was so useful to me. Um, so very similar, I think, working on projects when you're a small bit of that project, you're just helping with a particular analysis or um, even even being a balancing board uh, for each other on your projects, I think can be helpful. Um, you know, you might decide, ah, this is maybe not something I wanna get involved with, but um, it was very interesting to, to learn about what you're doing and maybe share what, mm -hmm. what, what others are doing. So that kind of interaction is, is invaluable. And it's also, um, it's also something that it's harder and harder later on during your PhD, you have a lot of folks working on a lot of diverse things. And, um, it's a really good opportunity to, um, to kind of get to, to interact with one another. So yeah, similar to George. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know, Lexi. Yeah, I definitely would encourage or back thinking about back time, I should have uh, looked for more internship opportunities that in different spots in academia, in different research labs, doing exchange, uh, short term research internships in industrial or in different places, startups, even. I mean, later when you are getting later stage of your PhD, you kind of uh, also in the place that you need to decide which step you are going to. Of course, you don't have to fix in one particular job after you pick the first one, but I wish that I have uh, uh, this kind of exposure early on so that uh, not like I'm regretting where I am right now, but uh, I feel like if as a student, that, that is the flexibility you can have. And at least, uh, 
I, I feel like a, most of the places they are rather friendly to have internships and like uh, also offer a lot of uh, mentorship opportunities. It's one way to build your network as well. So I feel like maybe if there are students asking what can they do in their early PhD labs or doing these uh, short-term breaks, um, internships in different places probably is uh, something I wish I have done before and I encourage students to consider that as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Maxi. Um, and I guess what, I guess uh, thank you so much folks really for answering all these questions, for being there and for you know all the advice that you've given our students. I guess I should, Nemo, do you think going back to the, you know, just sort of like wrapping up. I mean, I feel like we've already covered the questions in the Q&A. That was amazing. Uh, thank you so much for you know, being here and helping us out. Um, thank you for your time, everyone. I really appreciate yeah. the time that you could. Yeah, it, it's been great hearing all your perspectives. And just um, mm -hmm. final parting message for me, which is just um, it can feel very intimidating, but it's actually a lot of fun. And the people who are who like research just love what they're studying and doing and stuff like that and if you start talking to them they just it's like they light up so often done maybe not every day but many days and so it's a lot of fun and so give it a shot and if you don't like it you don't have to do it but you may find you love it that's all yep and Chris, here, Donna, did you have any parting words too since, gonna, since sorry i'm just sharing my slides just to get ready before people are um, I'll say that um, I think it feels, I feel very fortunate and I feel lucky. Of course, I'm not grinning every single day, um, but um, because I get to work remotely, I get to work on new data, sometimes from clinical trials. I get paid really well um, and get to interact with a lot of people. And I'm just, I still get sent to conferences. So there's you can still have a good work-life balance, um, even in research. And however you want to set up your your life is 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 possible within within research. So you can. Um, it doesn't have to be your whole life. It can be a really amazing career. Um, so that's the that that's what I'll say. Uh, so I, I feel very fortunate to have this career, um, and I have a lot of other interests. And so don't think that. All of us, you know, all we do is research. I mean, some people, all we do is research all the time. We're science heads, you know. Um, uh, I, at least for me, I, I definitely I have a lot of other interests in my life and um, and in my career. I get to get to do get to do really interesting research. So um, it's it's not my entire life, but I I feel really lucky to be to be doing it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. And and Lexi, I don't I wanted to give you the opportunity as well, just in case, but. No pressure. Yeah, I can just uh, say PhD um, or doing research. I, I would I would it I would put it that doing research is a major part of at least my experiences being a stu uh, PhD student and the, or in this program. But it doesn't mean that you need to accomplish accomplish something that so great. Don't put that pressure on yourself just try to hit that uh, milestones. I mean, it's okay that you eventually find it's not right for you. That's okay, that's totally fine, at least you tried. Personally, I still, um, I wouldn't encourage, I wouldn't just say to my kids that you need to get a PhD. I think it's, it's something that you can consider and based on your interest, I think that's the most important thing. If you are really interested in these fields, in the all the fields that you try to pursue a PhD, try it. And it is okay that eventually you find other passions and you decided to pursue uh, another career. That's that's my final words. Thank you, really. Thank you, everyone, for your time. This has been amazing. Everyone, just a round of applause. Like, really, thank you so much. That's been very helpful. Thank you. Um, and now for our awesome students, our attendees. So we just wanted to remind you that we have our next session scheduled for April 8th. How will my research change the world? So don't forget to register. And we have the link in the chat as well. Um, and um, 
we want to hear from you. So please complete the survey. When you end this meeting, you're going to get a survey. There's also the QR code for the survey. So please let us know if you have, if you want us to if any, have any questions answered, if you want us to focus on certain things, please let us know. That's how we know what you want and, you know, so that we can, you know, focus on, you know, what you need um, so that we can address your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to stop the share now. And again, like share, like thank our panelists again. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Nice All of you.